Welcome to Showdown, a series where I bring together a group of reviewers to talk about a show that we've each seen. In this episode, I bring together Paul Vale, Scott Matthewman and Fiona Scott to talk about a killer party. <laughs> How is she? Got to have the newest version of Zoom. What yeah, is it? I don't have that fancy version yet. See, I just spent the fortune, like, getting <laughs> done. You know what I mean? I didn't I shouldn't have bothered. So thank you and welcome to Showdown Episode 3. Welcome back to Mr. Paul Vale from Hello. the stage. Is it 20, 20 odd years we say now, don't we? 20 or so. <laughs> 20 or so. And Mr. Scott Matthewman, how are you? So which publications have you written for in all your um, years? So uh, I've started off on gay.com UK, which no longer exists. Uh, then, Nothing to uh, do with joined... you. No. Then I joined the stage where I was for about 10 years. Uh, and since leaving the stage, I review regularly for Musical Theatre Review and the Review Sub. Amazing. And there we are, the lovely Fiona Scott. How are you? Yeah, doing good, thank you. Um, I'm relatively green uh, in my reviewing career. I've been writing for initially London Theatre One and then joined uh, Broadway World UK in 2018. I was mostly covering stuff in Brighton and London down then, but now I live in Glasgow. So I'm, yeah, I felt, felt called back to the homeland after a few years in the South. <laughs> And I want to start by asking, because I I've, I've spoke to Paul previously about this, about his, well, his, can I say disdain for online theatre? Is that fair to say? Uh, dislike? Disdain, I'm not sure. I think disdain might be a strong word. It doesn't interest me, <laughs> um, generally. I much prefer, I prefer live theatre. Yeah. So how's it been for Fiona and Scott? So Fiona, start with you. How's it online worked for you? Has it worked? Um, I have weeks when I'm very grateful I get to see something at a theatre I'd never normally get to go to, like something at the Curve or Sounchester Barn Theatre. Um, but I also have weeks where I'm just sitting on my laptop going, oh, I wish I was sitting in an auditorium right now. <laughs> yeah. It's been a mix. And what about you, Scott? Because you do, you are a bit of a TV and film buff, so you're quite used yeah. to the, the, the small screen. So has this been a nice kind of merge? Yeah, I mean, when lockdown, lockdown first started, I made a conscious decision not to review any theatre online. And I just, it was like, wasn't in the right mindset for it at all. Um, but I'm gradually getting back into it. But I think for me, um, what works best are shows that do something that couldn't be done on stage. And if you can take advantage of the fact that it's online somehow, then for me, I think that's sort of like a, an extension of what theatre can do rather than a replacement. That is a good way of putting it. And it brings us nicely up to this show in particular, because it goes without saying this show, I mean, it, it might work on stage, but it was crafted and conceived specifically for, for this genre during the pandemic. So a killer party started off in America. Did anybody see the American version? A great dinner party Clips of it 
it. And uh, yeah, some favourites in there like Laura Osnes and uh, was it Jackie Byrne as well, I think was in it. Yeah. Um, Jeremy Jordan for me. I looked at the website and um, just to, to establish a few things to see where it was set apart from anything else because one of the things I really liked about it was the, how, how seamlessly it seemed to fit into it moved it from Duluth which I think is in Minnesota to Blackpool yeah. uh, and you just think oh right I see and I think throughout the, the change of references but well, there must have been quite a few changes of references were really good they were really quite funny Really clever, and it's because I was I was suspicious they must have got a British writer in to kind of update it, but there's no mention or reference to that. So whether the this, this American team have done a really good job or whether they just took some influences from from the cast and director, we're not sure. Um, but yeah, the, I think the adaptation it is an ad adaptation um, from the American version, which did very well. Um, I think it was within five days of it was released in August 2020, and within five days they had sold the rights to it. Um, and Katie Lipson straight in there snapped them up. Um, so let's talk about Katie first, because we all know her very well, I think, um, and certainly know the work of Aria. And they don't stop. Have you seen any of her recent work? Or have you got any favourites coming up, Fiona? Um, I still think about Pippin at the Southwark Playhouse. That was just um, such a beautiful production. Um, I think it was Genevieve Nicole was um, yes, playing yeah. the third. She was fabulous. Um, so yeah, that one's a real highlight for me. Um, I did watch the last five years um, recording as well. I think that show's kind of been ruined for me by lockdown just because there's been so many productions of it. Um, but I certainly loved what they did with it, with incorporating the piano um, as a character on the stage and having them interact and play it. Um, as a piano player, I found that a really interesting version. Yeah, I do. Yeah. It was a kind of go to show to do during lockdown. And it was a shame for Ari because obviously they had it up and running yes. before lockdown and then everybody else came and got a bite of it. Um, but credit to them. I mean, they're bringing it now into the West End and that cast is phenomenal. And what they did with it is remarkable. So, yeah, I think for anybody agreed, if you've seen other versions, you need to go and see theirs because it is kind of a definitive version. Yeah, I don't actually like the last five years as a musical it was like i like love some of the songs from it but just like structurally and a whole load of other reasons i don't particularly like it but it was um katie's staging at southwick playhouse was the last show i saw before the first lockdown and it's like i think the it, this was the production where i was like felt myself warming to it more than i thought i would yeah, um, which is begrudging to say, but yeah. <laughs> what about other productions by Aria that have taken your fancy, Scott? Uh, I would um, particularly say Rags, um, which uh, again, it was a, a, an American musical that was worked and reworked and, and reworked in America. And she brought it over to f play first at Hope Mill Theatre in Manchester and brought it down to London at the Park Theatre. I only saw the Park Theatre version, but it felt like um, having read what previous versions of the show were and how they were shaped, it felt like this was the, the version it always should have been. Yeah. And it was a really, really like heartwarming show. Um, and similarly, Bar Mitzvah Boy, which she staged at Upstairs at the Gatehouse, I really liked as well. It's a Jack Rosenthal musical that's not yeah. being frequently revived. Um, but yeah, so I've, she's done so many. Yeah, so many. What about you, Paul? Are there any favourites of yours? Well, um, certainly, rather like Scott, I've never been a fan of the last five years at all, but I was blown away by the production of it. Uh, I thought, oh, right, that works. That's how it should be done. Um, because any other way I'd seen, I saw many, many a production 10 years ago or so, and I just thought to myself, this is ridiculous. What a stupid idea for a musical. <laughs> um, but I've been seeing uh, Aria Entertainment stuff for years now, uh, a long, long time, when it was like they were doing their shows back at the Landor, um, their sort of compilation of new musicals, tryouts and stuff like that. Um, I, had, I haven't seen either of the ones that Scott mentioned. I didn't see Rags and I didn't see 
bum it's for boy but Katie certainly has come a long long way in terms of what she is able to achieve and um I find it interesting I've watched her great and I've seen some of her stuff and it's utterly beautiful and I'm thinking do you know what this is fantastic this is this is why I like going to the theatre um but conversely sometimes there are duds you have that and uh Thankfully, we are able to say one way or the other. I know what she certainly know what she's capable of. I'm intrigued to see, isn't she? Yeah, she's producing Cruise, isn't she? Yeah, so they produced it online and now it's going into the the Duchess, I believe, isn't it? Far from the licks and hooks and screams and wails of the flaccid tracks we made in the cave, these songs didn't care about catchy. They didn't want you to hear it once and have it stuck inside your head as you walked around school the next day. This was music for grown-ups. This music was cold and hard and dark and dangerous, industrial, sandblasted, rusted, like a song bashed out of scraps of metal, parts of old cars, pots and pans and guns and tanks, thrown in a pile at the end of the world. This music didn't want to make you feel good. It said, feel how you feel, and however you feel, because of how you feel, in spite of how you feel, just don't. Notice Scott um, wanted to catch it online before he sees it in reality. Yeah. I have absolutely no intention of seeing it online. I want to see it on the stage, and it's my first production, so uh, I'm looking forward to seeing okay. it. What it is? Okay. Well, yeah. I again, it was a show that I think definitely the staging of it online. It's not a point the camera at a stage. Um, shoot, it's definitely it's it's much more a feel of a promenade piece. Uh, it's all shot on location, and the camera follows the character round as he actually um, moves between scenes. And I actually like, really enjoyed it, and I actually think there's some aspects of that production that um, a stage production might actually struggle with, um, or would stage in a very different way to get the the similar sense of intimacy that that does um i just do there's another aria show that i really do want to recommend is uh, it's only life it's a review of uh, john Buccino yes. songs at the, um, which at the union theater and i think i saw it four times and that was i, I couldn't see it anymore because it closed <laughs> that's just because you're a massive hearsay fan wasn't it that was it. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And I was most disappointed when Danny wasn't in the cast. <laughs> and what about you, Fiona? Did you catch Cruz while it was online? Yeah, unfortunately, I didn't um, make the online um, stream viewing. And at the moment, I'm waiting until I'm vaccinated, until I go back in the theatre. Um, so we'll probably miss this one for sure. But, uh, yeah, we'll see what comes in the autumn. So just picking up on that, so that's an interesting point. How are you, are you apprehensive about going back to a theatre because of that? Yeah, just a little bit. I work in drug development during the day, and so I feel like I'd be a bit of a hypocrite having um, told my friends and family to stay at home and minimise who I see. I'm generally in the just because you can doesn't mean you should camp. So I'm going to continue to support digital shows as much as I can over the coming months until I feel I've got that extra layer of protection to go back into an auditorium. But yeah, yeah that's where I am on this. And are you excited about seeing live theatre? Oh, absolutely. Um, I've got a kind of a list of shows to try and get to, but uh, yeah, I would like to just make sure I've got the jab first before I go and buy any tickets. <laughs> Amazing. So coming back to a killer party. So what were what well, I mean, I've got to start with Scott, because that five stars, I mean, can't do any wrong. <laughs> well the thing is let's, it's like let's discuss I think, uh, 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 the best shows um lean into their subject matter and go for it. And that's what this show does. Yeah. Um it's like if you knock it because it's got like really cheap production values then sort of like, I'm sorry, but that's exactly what they were going for. Yeah. <laughs> and if you knock it because it's a bit silly, likewise, if you knock it because it's not the most um, engaging of murder mystery stories, it's like, similarly, sort of like, people don't turn into Midsummer Murders to actually guess who the murderer is. They <laughs> so it's sort of like, it's like, 
every everything that they went for they achieved and i think that's the mark of a really good show exactly what did you think fiona um i gave a three star for my review which was kind of like i it's this thing where as you see more digital theater you compare it to what you've seen before i'm also very aware of what i'm bringing to a room so i knew i'd gone for a very long hike that day so a wee bit under energy which you know <laughs> shouldn't be an excuse but i think i was in one of those frames of minds where i was like oh i would just we'd like to see all of these people on a stage um and the in particular the 90 minute um I was watching the full 90 minutes in one go um, and so getting the, the same music every 15, 20 minutes or so um, was there. But otherwise, yeah, all the characters were certainly uh, there. The cast performances were there, but it didn't quite kind of hit mark for me for an interview. Yeah, so I, did, I had the same 90 minute show, but I did actually stop after every couple or so, do something else and then come back. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe I didn't get that same sense of repetition with the the theme music well i did watch it in one go and i was kind of wishing that it had a netflix facility to skip the intro <laughs> at every moment um but yeah I, I watched it all in one go and i agree i i watched it first time in a, a quite a bad mood and then spoke to paul who raved about it so i was like maybe i'm missing something so i, I went back and watched it again and actually i was like ah, oh, yeah i get it now um, but yeah, that leads us nicely on. So, what, Paul? Tell me your impressions. Well, I, um, I I usually go to most online shows in a bad mood. Um, <laughs> Let's be fair. You go to um, a lot of <laughs> you go to a lot of real world shows in a bad mood as well, Paul. <laughs> absolutely. Um, you can't no, blame the company. <laughs> So, no, I, I, I approached this one, and also, I don't know if you're aware of it, I think you know, I'm right in saying it had a, a delayed opening. It, it was, press night was supposed mm. to be one delay, and then it, and it kept putting off and kept putting off, and I'm like, oh, for God's sake. And then I think it came at a time when I was really um, pushed for stuff. Uh, and you think, oh, God, I've got to watch it now. You know, there's no other choice, because that's the day you have to do it now. Uh, so it's press night, it moved. Um, uh, so I went and it started and I thought, well, here we go. Cheap production values. Jason Manford, what's he doing in it? Why is he in it? <laughs> and what? And, and I just got dragged into it. And I just thought, this is so daft. Yeah. But it doesn't try to be anything else. Mm -hmm. And then by the time you get to Rachel Tucker, I was just <laughs> on the floor. I just thought, this is hilarious. And I'm thinking, why isn't she doing more comedy? She's so funny. <laughs> Yeah, we'll come oh, back yeah. to that. Yeah. So, no, I, I just thought it was, uh, you know, for the, yeah, you can knock production values, but as Scott quite um, uh, properly pointed out, you know, it was meant to look cheap. It was meant to look like it's being done in everyone's home. Uh, but all the time I kept thinking to myself, I'd love to see this on stage. I would, I would kill to see this on stage. <laughs> it, it's so funny. But I want to see it on stage with this cast. Okay. I don't. I think I'd be hard pushed to see. You know, you know, if you haven't got Rachel Tucker coming in for five minutes to do her thing in the middle, <laughs> it's a, it's a shame. Well, I mean, this was the thing when I first sat down to watch it. You are wondering whether it is purposely trying to emulate the original, which was filmed. They did film it themselves. Yeah. Um, whereas what we had with the brilliant cinematography, these people they went to each other's houses, but it was filmed purposely. Um, and within that, that like I say, they, they did then try to emulate it. So you kind of were sat there as an audience thinking, are there, what is this? And once you kind of get over that, I think you can start to appreciate it. Because um, certainly it is tongue in cheek and it is very funny how they kind of nod to it. And they, they point out the fact like every room looks the same. And I think <laughs> one, one of the my favourite highlights was when Emma's flatmate walks through the shop um <laughs> brilliant and i did i did think with um if i can just say with because all the costumes looked like it was stuff they cobbled together for themselves apart from oscar um <laughs> no, they were all his own <laughs> no yeah <laughs> yeah if anybody's watched oscar conan murray throughout for the throughout the last year i think he he has a dressing up box that's bigger than his flat yeah it's bigger than the nationals costume department i believe <laughs> Not to mention the wigs. Exactly. But oh, this yeah. is the thing. When we when we look at this production, and it was announced 
I think back in that back in March it was announced and it was supposed to be coming out on the 19th of April and then it was delayed to the 24th and then delayed again to the May. Um, is timing important? Because obviously this show did so well in the pandemic in America, but coming out of the pandemic now, do we think it's, it's hit the right time or would it have done better earlier or... I think it probably would have done better earlier. I think it's like if they if they put it out any later, I think they'd have had problems. Yeah. Um, so um, definitely, it's like I don't think they could have coped with many more delays. No. Yeah. And as you say, wait. Well, so this is a nine-part series, and I'm really intrigued by this. And you might be able to talk more about this, Scott, because. I'm from that generation where comedies used to be 30 minutes, an hour long, and you used to get 24 of them in a series. And now it seems like the series are reducing down to like 12 episodes, 10 episodes, even the length, like some brilliant comedy series that I particularly like on Netflix, um, special and bonding, have 15 minute, nine minute episodes. And even Shit's Creek, they're all very li- reflectively 21 minutes. Um, yeah. well, so something like Shit's Creek is, is short because uh, the channels they're originally broadcast on have lots of adverts. Yeah. So we're seeing the versions without adverts. But stuff that gets made for streaming um, will tend to aim for a particular length, but doesn't necessarily have to be exactly the right length, which a broadcast program would have to because um, there's no, there's nothing coming immediately after it. Um, and that's why you find some, like some of the, like the Marvel TV series, like One Division and uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, each episode is a slightly different length because they just edited it to what the story demands. Um, and something like this, sort of like, um, this is definitely going for the vibe of sort of like short YouTube webisodes type things and deliberately keeping each episode short, um, which does mean that the theme music just pops up every nine minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but it it also, I think, helps contain the storytelling as well. Because if you know, it's like you each episode has got to have one interrogation and at least one song then it's actually keeping everything along. And there are some musicals where sort of like you'll you'll end up with sort of like five songs in in one block and then you can go for like half an hour of book. And it's like that is that deathly. I mean if you watch if you watch the film of Frozen, all the songs are in the first half. Yeah, that's just popped into my head as well. Yeah. La La Land felt a bit like that as well. Felt like it was very oh, song Yeah, I don't consider La La Land mm-hmm. a musical. I'd rather it wasn't yeah. a film, but you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that pacing is definitely, it certainly broke up the episodes at insensible places, which I've said in my review. Um, but yeah, I was binging it. <laughs> Do we suspect that this is because they are tailoring to an audience of TikTok generation who are used to these bike jumps? Should we be worried that this is the future for, for theatre? I don't necessarily think so, but because um, I don't know in America, whether they were all the episodes were released at once or were, were they released episodically. Um, so if, if it, if they were released sort of like every other day or once a week or something sort of like keeping them short actually works to their advantage. Yeah. Um, but if it was all released at, at once and it's just expecting people to sort of like watch it in chunks, I don't necessarily know whether that would necessarily have been the right choice. I mean, I suppose, for me, I was sat watching it wondering why it was episodic in that way. I suppose um, on Broadway, if they did film it themselves in their own homes, then keeping it short is probably a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Because they're not cameramen, they're probably filming on their phones and all that sort of thing. So it just makes it snappier. So I don't, I think, had camera crews been involved, there might have been lengthier episodes. Um, but I think it's just the, the way it was created originally and they were trying to copy that. So let's talk about the songs because we had every style and genre in there, I think. I certainly got a few power ballads in there. I remember kind of going, oh yeah, and just little groups going there. And yeah, I can still got the, the flute to do 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 Certainly a couple of uh, earworms in there. I mean, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say the the flute playing was the best one, but I no. that. that was the point I was just going. So, like, 
I feel like I should be drinking now. <laughs> <laughs> it was, as we say, a kind of ensemble piece. And it's very hard to kind of pick out a favour. But I will start with Rachel. What an amazing voice. Her comedy timing was brilliant. She's she's perfect. She needs to do more comedy. She's picking up on the Ben Foster, though. Those boy band moves and that skinny white jeans were brilliant. I like my own Ben Foster. I mean, he had big shoes to fill because I am a massive Jeremy Jordan fan. Yeah, I'd, I'd take a Ben Foster over Jeremy Jordan. <laughs> These interviews are completely free and I don't make any money from them. But if you would like to support me, I've set up that fest to produce theatrical events to raise money for HIV charities. If you would like to make a donation, please check out our website or follow us at That Fest UK. So let's talk about the writing in particular. So we had the book was written by Rachel, who won an Emmy for The Daily Show and How I Met Your Mother and Kate Kerrigan. Um, so they do have like a kind of TV background. Do you think that kind of benefited the piece? What do you think, Fiona? Um, yeah, there were certainly gags that I enjoyed. That now, yeah, you know, when you you do look at their their bios, you go, yeah, actually that makes sense. These kind of quick, and you'll miss some references. Um, yeah, I think it was a strength that did make. Um, yeah, there were kind of certainly quirks and, and lines that even I still remember now um, from the show that works well. And um, so, yeah, I think a background of TV certainly helps. And Scott? Uh, yeah, I think um, definitely if you're going to produce something for sort of like this theatre TV hybrid, then actually having a knowledge of the language of television uh, definitely helps. Uh, I think the, I was, remembering the first interview scene um i can't remember the line but sort of like whoever she's interrogating just said oh you must have come in here with a a grand plan and it just quickly cuts to a little flashback of her just before she enters the room and and then cuts straight back and that's something you couldn't do on stage but is very much the the vocabulary of television or comedy film yeah yeah so um so i think bringing that sort of knowledge into musical theatre is great. Um, Yeah, there is nothing about the script uh, that I heard that made me think, ah, these are TV writers. It all sounded to me like it was theatre stuff, which which made it work perfectly as far as I was concerned, because obviously (laughs) there was a lot of crafting going on in the TV background but actually they made it sound like it's something that had uh, been put together by a bunch of theatre people. Yeah. And when it came to the, the music and lyrics, so these are bona fide musical theatre. So we've got the, the lyrics by Nathan Tyson from, from Amelie, incredible show. And then Jason Howland, who won a Grammy for Beautiful. Um, although you could argue he didn't write the songs in Beautiful, but he, he certainly did a good job <laughs> with the orchestration. Um, so yes, yeah, so, I mean the musical fit. I mean the songs. Let's talk about the songs because we had every style and genre in there. I think possible. Hi. What did you think, Fiona? Um, yeah, it certainly got a few power ballads in there. I remember kind of going, oh yeah, and just little groups going there. And yeah, I can still got the the flute to do 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 do. Certainly a couple of uh, earworms <laughs> in there, but uh, certainly yeah, when the songs came along, they weren't. It didn't feel like filler. They were. Um, entertaining to watch um, and yeah they had they, they had a good gimmick in them and um, that sort of thing and I particularly enjoyed the duet between Cedric and, and Debbie and the way they made it look like they were in the same room. I mean I wouldn't I wouldn't say the, the flute playing was the best one but I no. <laughs> but yeah every song does kind of showcase this incredible cast that we'll come on to in a minute. Um, but yeah, how what did you think about the songs, Paul? Did were there any favourites for you that stood out? Oh gosh, yeah, there are a couple of them. I um I think in the first instance, I really liked the um Oscar song. Yeah. That was when I began to get the genre and where they were going, and it got more and more elaborate. And I just thought, this is hilarious, this is so good. And what I liked about the songs is whilst they were very, very broad way. Um, they weren't pastiches, they weren't obvious pastiches on numbers, but there was a sense, I loved Ben Forster's Big Cat number. I yeah. just thought, <laughs> and I thought this is pure Disney. 
just Disney, and uh, and completely superfluous to everything going on. And I rather like the duet because you thought, God, that must have been complicated to put together. Um, a duet, two people. Um, um, was it recorded? I'm assuming it was recorded and they recorded it separately. So the, it the sound did sound like easy. it was separate. Mm -hmm. There was a slight, it maybe was just my internet connection while I was watching it. There was a slight misalignment that was annoying me. But yeah, um, yeah I think it was wise to do that. I think it would have been mixing it up. I love that duet. And I thought, oh, God, yeah, that's that's a good number. Um, and in the, in the game, you begin to think, God, how have they put that together? That's really strange. It's really unusual. Of course, it'd be a great, you could do it on stage easily. Yes, yeah, so the musical supervisor was Nick Barstow, who was recently musical director at, with Zorro um, for Aria um, and has worked with him a few times. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm not sure myself even when or how they recorded it, but I mean, he certainly knows his stuff. He, he's worked a lot with... Alice Fern recently for intermissions and recorded their charity single. Um, so he's got his own recording studio at home. So whether he dragged everybody around or or what, but yeah, he certainly did a very good job of mastering those songs. Mm. Um, and they all did a real, I think it lent itself to, we weren't looking for a lame is kind of close up wanting to see them. Thing. Like I think Rachel in particular, the way she sent up herself, like her vocals are extraordinary any time of the day um but that freedom to then be able to just kind of play off herself i think really really worked what do you think scott about the the songs yeah no absolutely um and as paul said earlier i think like rachel being able to actually show that she's a great comedic actress despite um, getting a name for herself in musical theater with the big big serious roles like right, in uh, wicked and come from away um i'm so I'm really excited to see where she can actually apply those um, skills next. Um, I also must look um, the later songs. I forget the name of the actual song, but um, with all the choreography and lots of hands, hand run, yeah, yeah. the hand run. Uh, that was it's like that was the point I was just going. So like, I feel like I should be drinking now because <laughs> this was like if I was drunk, this would be even more enjoyable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Were you watching in the afternoon? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I was watching we... it in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Even better. Get those bloody Marys down, yeah. Um, but yeah, we've got to speak about the, the casting because Jane Deitch did an incredible job. Again, she's worked with Aria several times and she pulled it out because obviously they were comparing it to Broadway. This was a UK version, so that had to be of a UK standard. And if you did, if you dissect it further, you can look at Ben Sperring, who was the director, has worked with a lot of these people before. So, I mean, whether that comes into it, whether he just that trusted director performer relationship that he called on. So, he, for example, I think it's Oscar and both Oscar and Emma have worked with him in Toxic Avenger. I think Ashley was in it at one point as well. Um, so yeah, so let's talk. I, I mean, it, it was, as we say, a kind of ensemble piece and it's very hard to kind of pick out a favor, but I will start with Rachel because I agree, like we're used to her belting, but her comedy timing was brilliant. And that, that the whole character and the character that, and I just, I think it's the Irish accent just makes me gag every time I hear it anyway. But yeah, I'm the same. Like, I really, really want to see Rachel do more of this. And I think she will. I think this is kind of... I'm not not that she needs any help with her career. I think she's doing <laughs> quite well. But I think this will certainly reflect in that. Like, people will see her in a different light. Did anybody else have any thoughts about Rachel? Paul, what did you think of her? Well, no, I, I, I mean, I've always liked Rachel on stage. I mean, she's brilliant belter, as you say. Um such a gorgeous voice. I think I saw, I saw in Edinburgh, she did a, uh, an in-conversation sort of thing in Edinburgh with songs. And um, I'd never really heard her sing one-to-one. You know, -one, and I just thought to myself, what an amazing voice. Yeah. And what a funny person, because she was chatting as herself. I thought she was quite funny. And again, it is that Irish accent. She's just gorgeous. Um, but um, seeing her in this... I just thought she's hilarious. She's hilarious in close up, and that, and that is funny. Um, and you, she just talked her way through it, taking everything, all of the daft plot, with such seriousness. 
Um, and I just thought, no, she's she's perfect. She needs to do more comedy now, even if it's musical comedy. <laughs> she must do more comedy. Um, picking up on uh, Ben Foster, though, I for me, like those boy band moves and that skinny white jeans were brilliant. I don't know if we're supposed to talk about that because it's <laughs> yeah, if it's a surprise element, but. Uh, you can just put a spoiler warning. Uh, yeah. That's the thing. But Fiona, what did you think of that? Was it was it good for you? Oh yeah, just the way he popped up. I want my own Ben Forster kind of here and there. Interviewed him before, and he's just such a sweetheart. Um, and yeah, not not the worst uh, person to kind of center your life on. Find your yeah. yeah. Ben Forster. I mean, he had big shoes to fill because I am a massive Jeremy Jordan fan. Mm. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd take a Ben Foster over Jeremy Jordan. <laughs> and I thought actually they did a really good job of getting the interaction with him and Ashley Samuels, mm -hmm. despite the fact that Ben was on green screen and the size of a uh, uh, pencil. And we've got to commend at this point the interaction between the characters because we are, we are aware that they're filming it by themselves. Well, there were very few moments where it, it, they dropped the ball. It, the energy was sustained. The kind of the, the quick timing was there. They did a really, really good job, didn't they? What did you think, Fiona, about that? Um, yeah, certainly having seen other shows that gave the impression they were all in the room together that didn't quite work, um, they did do that. But part of that, I guess, was in the self-depreciating humour way it was written, where they were pointing out, oh, yeah, we're clearly obviously in the same house. Um, I think a lot of credit has to go to the editing. I think yeah. for getting, reducing those kind of beats and moments of silence between dialogue. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, that definitely helped. But uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> and I loved Zara Monsuri's design, like especially the stop motion model. I just thought that was a nice touch, wasn't it? Yeah, that was a nice way to move between the rooms and yeah, mixed up a bit. Yeah, I also liked uh, Debbie Currup, who was like playing her character just so straight, but in the most bizarre clown outfit. <laughs> and just uh, that, that contrast is just like, because I think lesser actors would have put that on and played the clown. Yeah. But she was playing Maggie Smith dressed as Coco. <laughs> <laughs> and she is remarkable again like i remember her back when she did rent and then most more recently she's known for for her olivier nod uh i think it was um bodyguard wasn't it that she got a Olivier nomination um but yeah she again is just a powerhouse and brilliant like so so funny incredible what did anybody else think of her no i, I thought she was she um she was wonderful um I'd also like to do a shout out for Jason as well. Because when he came on at the beginning, I thought, well, that's the last we see of him. It's just a bit part. That's all, but of course, that changes. <laughs> um, and in, in Spoilers. complete madness. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, actually, just as, a, just as a slight criticism, something I don't think worked as well, and I don't know if it's a difference with uh, the bang uh the crossing the atlantic or anything i thought the names were really silly yeah and not in a fun way they were just bad it was kind of panto-esque time it was old vartha mccarthy you think what's that supposed to mean what who's called vartha yeah i think that that was the sort of because there's a uh that is plays that name plays such a fundamental role in the denouement. I had sort of hoped that they could have actually picked a combination of names that mm. um, didn't draw as much attention to the discrepancy. Mm. To be honest, I do wonder if the, ca the, the cast in America chose their names and we had Vivica Orson Wells. And you think, where does that come from? <laughs> That's just bizarre. And what what did yeah. you think of Jason Manford Scott? Oh, I liked him. I was like, I think he's uh, he's really come into himself since he started doing musical theatre. I think uh, initially people were a bit sceptical, thought and um, thinking sort of like, oh, this is just another bit of stunt casting. Get someone who's a a known name from some other field, uh, but he throws himself into every role that he gets and 
delivers some amazing performances. Um, I think um, I really enjoyed him in Curtains as well, which is another murder yeah. mystery musical. Mm-hmm. Um, and I did think, like, like Paul, I was sort of like thinking, oh, so well, they've got they've got the big name in, but it's like they'll just like off him in the first couple of minutes and just let the rest of the West End Wendy's get on with it. Um, I thought it's like his uh, career in Killer Party would be over quicker than his job as host of the One Show. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, but that's the thing with Jason, I think, because he felt that he had a lot to prove coming into this industry. But I think he's he's certainly done it. And the work that he's choosing at the moment, I think he's doing a workshop of the new Irish musical Daisy with Caroline Kay, where she promises that he's going to be doing an Irish accent. So commending him for like kind of giving these things a, a try and kind of branching out from what we expect from him. Um, I think it's brilliant. What do you think of him, Fiona? Uh, yeah, I'm just thinking actually one of the last shows I saw in Glasgow before I moved south was Jason with Phil Duf- Jupiter and the Chitty Chitty Bang Bang Tour. Um, and yeah, it was just a really sweet, correct, correct, because I can't even speak words today. Um, but yeah, I think we, we very easily box people into the thing that we know them of first, be it the telly um, for stand up and things. And you can bring that, you know, this is a comedy piece, so why wouldn't you cast? A comedian who can also sing you know he's released a, an album of show tunes at least one i think since then so yeah i think it was a, a fair choice um for for him and he did the role well and speaking of comedy roles we've got to, you've already mentioned oscar conlon murray who for anybody who doesn't know him like i first was introduced to him when he did the toxic avenger where he played 20 in quick successions, multiple characters. And then most recently, if anybody saw Only Fools and Horses, he steals that show with his barista. Um, yeah, he is uh, the reason to watch Only Fools and Horses, the musical. Yes, I'd agree. And not forgetting, of course, he was a dame in Panto. Yes, yeah, a turbine, yeah. Yes. Oh no, he wasn't. <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid I was a late bloomer. It was the, it was, I think it was the night that theatres closed in March last year, and it was him singing and um, losing my mind on the tube. It was seeing yeah. that video on Twitter. I was like, who is this guy? And uh, yeah, I've been hooked ever since. <laughs> this is it. Like he has come into his own mm-hmm. throughout lockdown with these brilliant videos that he's created. And this was the thing when I was watching this because. There's two things. So I've seen Oscar in a Sondheim review and his voice is exceptional. And I think people forget that because he does all this comedy now. So there are two aspects. Like he could be a bona fide West End star because of his voice alone. But also there were elements of when I was watching this of League of Gentlemen or some TV vehicle which would really, really suit him. And he would do it exceptionally well. What do you think, Paul? Well, he certainly, he certainly proved himself versatile and he certainly put himself out there, as you say, in the lockdown. And we've seen him. I know of him. And and to think to yourself, you know what, I want to see what else he can do. I want to see where, where he's going, because at the moment I've only seen him do broad comedy. Um, uh, and I want to see I want to see him in something serious. I want to see how versatile he is, because I think you can have a, a perfectly good career uh carrying on doing the same thing again and again and again go from comedy to comedy but i think uh the mark of a a great actor is someone who tries to diversify and whose fans allow him to divide or uh, to diversify in that way so you can accept them in other roles yeah absolutely I think it was losing my mind that he was sang in particular in this Sondheim review, and it was just stunning. So, yeah, we're l- looking forward to see what he can come out with. Um, so moving on, the great Harriet Forbes. So again, worked with Aria before in Mame. Was interestingly in Midsummer Night's Murder last week. So hopping Ooh. from <laughs> twice. I Who would have thought? I watched an old episode and a, re- a new episode and she was playing a completely different character in both. I thought, <laughs> okay, I don't suppose we, I don't think we're supposed to remember that episode. <laughs> <when it's dead. laughs> oh, I think of- some emerges have run out of uh, actors now. They're just like, go back to the beginning and just like, go all the way through again. But what did we think of her character and, and, and her characterization? Because she, she is phenomenal. I do love her. Fiona. 
Oh God, okay. she was just fab. It was kind of just, it's so hard, I guess, to, you know, not have the, you know, your scene partner in the room with you to bounce off of and they still just, yeah, she absolutely nailed it, I think. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, her character in particular was kind of a solitary character anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but she certainly kind of milked it. I mean, that, <laughs> a lot of it did, didn't they? That's I'm a very polite way of putting it. Yes. <laughs> She's going to kill me for that. <laughs> <laughs> and let's talk about Amara Okareki, because I've seen her a couple of times. I saw her in Les Mis and then in Oklahoma. And she's got an incredibly classic voice which again like i say all these songs kind of lend them to, again I, I think it's down to the casting they they picked performers who could really match the songs i felt um what did what did you think of her paul again it, i think one of the, the things that scott picked up on earlier um, or no i think you, you mentioned yourself was the the fact of how for me what struck me is i felt there were um 10 or 12 actors working together as a company, even though they were all in separate rooms. And that's the thing, no one person particularly stood out, but everyone seemed to be working together. And bearing in mind, they probably hadn't met in the whole period of thing. Probably I not that, at all, some of them. Yeah. But I find that absolutely remarkable. So all, all of them are really, really good. I, I, there's, there, there's not, there's, there wouldn't be one that I would pinpoint, not even Rachel. It is that thing of like everyone got a chance to shine. In it. I think that's the good thing about it. Everyone got a chance to, to do their bits and to show what they can do. But yeah, so talking about the, the accents and then the adaptation, ad adapting it to Blackpool, do we think it worked? Did it, did it translate? Oh, definitely. Yes. Yeah, I think... Um, had you had you not discovered it was written in America first, you wouldn't have known any different. I don't think there was nothing to give it away, apart from the Broadway sounds. Mm -hmm. Fiona, um, yeah, so you can have a dinner party anywhere in the world. So um, I think it, it did transfer across quite well. Um, I did like the kind of idea of the what was it the, the smallest regional theatre or something that. Martha MacArthur was owning and yeah it just it gave it that kind of familiar feel so I think yeah in that aspect of it and they, you know as, as we said earlier they updated any cultural references that helped to root piece where it was. Exactly and were there any highlights for you any particular scenes that still like because for me again it was Emma's little dog that just I think it's, she's got this brand new little puppy called Audrey who like managed to like on cue jump up at the sock that she was holding up <laughs> run up with it um and it was a couple well, of you say it was on cue we don't know how many takes it took <laughs> <laughs> well i think it was i think that dog is destined for great things i can tell maybe that's why it was delayed <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've got everything dog. except the dog so it's, and that's taken us a week <laughs> But even in that scene, there were a couple of little nods to like, she brought out a, a t-shirt from Toxic Avenger and a mug from Come From Away. And just little uh, kind of in-jokes like that, that perhaps, I mean, I know it's because I'm stagey, but like, I thought they were brilliant. What were your highlights, Fiona, if you had any? Um, there was a sequence I particularly liked um, when Just In Case was getting ready to switch from being traffic warden to detective. And it was just this seamless, like, into the wardrobe, different outfit, into the wardrobe. Yeah, that bit. Which, given it was done from home, that was just, yeah, it was very clever. <laughs> exactly. And I'm going to do something quite, because, like I say, there was quite an ensemble, and we will be here all night if we're going <laughs> to keep talking about them. But let's do, like, a quick, rapid succession, see how this works. And we just say one word. I'm going to say a cast name. And then we'll take it in turns to say one word about their performance. So we'll start with Rachel Tucker. Just one word about Rachel Tucker. Fabulous. Hilarious. Revelatory. Jason Manford. Pompous. <laughs> Well-rounded. Funny. Cedric uh, Neal. As I usually describe him, riftastic. Oh, one word. Uh, great. Stunning. <laughs> I'm running out of one word description. Let's move on to Lucas Rush. Oh, just so sweet. <laughs> Manic. Sweetheart. Ben Forster. Oh, angelic. I'd go with the same. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
See, the shorter the review, the longer it takes to write. <laughs> yeah. I'm just trying to think, how would I sum him up in one word? He made me laugh. I, I, um, uh, surprising. Oscar Conlon Murray. Hilarious. Superstar. Did anyone say hilarious? <laughs> <laughs> Harriet Thorpe. Fab. <laughs> I'll drink to that. Fab fab. <laughs> Amara Okareki. Diva. <laughs> Sweet. Stunning. Debbie Kuro. Brilliant. Deadpan. Riotous. So Ashley Samuels. Okay, just great. <laughs> Lovable. Fun. The students from Mount View. <laughs> um, one by one. Yeah, one by one. <laughs> <laughs> no. And if we now talk about the future of like online productions, we are now coming to the to the end. This week, live theatre is returning, and we're eventually. You've already said, Paul, that you're you're getting the chance to return. What is your first show back, Fiona? That you've got booked up. Um, at the moment, it's Jessica Rosk at the Cuddergan Hall in February, but I am hoping to get uh, first night at Wicked tomorrow when the, the uh, box office opens. So that's kind of long term goals. But um, I would I would quite like there to be a mix because, like I said, I get um, being up in Glasgow, London isn't as handy anymore. Um, so I would love being able to catch the odd thing um, digitally um, that I wouldn't normally get to see then. But equally, I can't wait to get back in the theatre once I've got that vaccine. Yeah. And Scott, what have you got coming up? Um, well, I'm not supposed, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say, but I might be going to a um, dress rehearsal of the new immersive Doctor Who play, Ooh. Time Fracture. Um, so failing that, I think the following week, I'm probably going to... Um, see Public Domain, which is a um, musical. Watch that online. I did yeah, watch that watched online. It. And uh, it's an, again, it's another one that worked really, really well online. Uh, and I'm actually intrigued as to whether it would work quite as well in yeah. person because the subject matter and also the style of presentation online were really well suited. Um, so, how it actually works in a live theatre environment. Um, is going to be really interesting. Yeah. Um, and how do you feel about the, the switch back to live theatre? Are you, are you going to miss on live theatre? Do you think it? Do you think it will stick around now? I I think people have begun have taken the year to see what can be done, uh, and there will be people now thinking, how can I supplement my stage work with uh, something online that potentially helps bring in extra revenues, which would make a theatre run more feasible. Um, as well as there, some people might just like just carry on producing stuff using theatre people and theatre craft and merging that with online skills to carry on blurring the lines between stage and screen, which I think would be really good. Um, and but I think, yeah, I'm sort of still a little bit anxious about opening up again because I was just reading this afternoon about how Chile is the probably the one country in the world that has a, a, a like 100% vaccination rate um, and they opened up everything um, and are now experiencing a, the, a larger spike of coronavirus than they had last year wow. so it's so I'm I, um, keen to make sure that we reopen sensibly mm -hmm. um, and for a lot of theatres that means that actually it's not going to be possible to reopen particularly like the larger theatres are able to do it because they can close off so many seats and just about eke uh, out um, shows with the limited audiences they have. Producers like Nika Burns have said straight off the bat, it's like we're going to be making a massive loss, but we've got to open. Uh, but at least she's also taking the opportunity to bring shows to the West End that wouldn't otherwise get a chance, which I think is really good as well. Mm -hmm. And so I think 
that is something that actually with all the anxiety that comes with reopening i think that's actually sort of like a really positive out, outlook as well yeah and they were helped a lot by the government there, there were a couple of grants and some subsidy um but yeah like completely commendable for for her innovation to 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 and her ambition and kind of commitment to reopening these theaters and providing an opportunity for people who are rising stars as the festival dictates well that's it i think that's with with most theaters being closed for a year obviously sort of like um summer and um part of last year we had sort of like some open air um performances and then sort of like limited openings of the west end before christmas before they all shut down again um but for a lot of places it's like this is the the first chance they've got to open and for a lot of audiences this is the first chance they're going to get to see and it's i think it's really good that that appetite for any form of theater can actually fuel a wider variety of theater rather than just bringing back the same old faces and and relying on the same musicals to bring everybody in yeah what about you, Paul? What you got lined up in your diary next? Well, um, I wasn't worried about going back to stage until sh- Scott mentioned Chile. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm just yeah. going to go and cancel a few things. <laughs> okay. uh, but no, I've got the, the there's a press launch for Above the Stacks Cabaret Evenings next uh, week. I'll pop along to that uh, to hear what's going on. And then I've got crews on... Uh, uh, I think it's the Thursday, isn't it? Cruise on Thursday, and then Mamma Mia, no, not Mamma Mia, um, Abamania on <laughs> Friday. At the Very similar. Very different. <laughs> <laughs> kind of the same. There's just no story. Um, We're talking about Mamma Mia. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I've got that, and then the following week I'm over at Horn Church for Naples Island. And uh, get around that picture, you spread it. Oh, god, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I've got a, but my week, my evenings are starting to fill up, and you just think to yourself, oh, god, there goes the sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm the same. I'm back in uh, for 10 days in June, and already I've got every day it's got something booked in and I'm knackered already at just looking at my diary. Um, but part of it, I mean, the, the, the new Rally Fest it's by Paul Taylor Mills at the Turbine Theatre. There's a couple of those that I'm going to definitely go and see. Blowing Whistles by Matthew Todd. Uh, oh, so you're doing Blowing Whistles? Yeah, do you want to come? I've got tickets. Ooh. Yeah, I'm going to have to look out for that as well because it's like Blowing Whistles is the one show that I think needs to come back well, um, this is it. So I know because I'm I'm friends with Matthew, and we've been discussing for a long time because it it had a, it was really good. I loved it, and he updated it a couple of years ago with Andrew Keats at the helm, and he he brought in um, Rufus Hound, which I thought was odd casting, but apparently it worked. Um, but yeah, they, they've now brought it back for as part of this festival. So it's only on for one night. Um, so grab a ticket if you can. Um, but yeah, it should be good. Well, I might come along with you to that. What? Uh, send me the details because um, I, I've known Matt. I think I saw a very early production of it in Croydon. Well, that's that, mistaken. Yeah, that. I think the earliest production was that not at the Sound Theatre, which used to be in Leicester Square, which is now M and M's World. But as what? As no, what? there was there was a production um, with Paul Keating at the. Um, what's the Leicester Square? Yeah. But it's also directed by Susie McKenna, who is... Oh, wow. Yeah. So, I mean, the casting hasn't been announced, but it's only a freehander anyway. Um, so I'll be interested to see. I mean, they might get... <laughs> get out. your mind out of the gutter, Vale. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they call them. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, on that note, <laughs> let's get off into your evening and enjoy the rest of your night. It's a long day. I didn't even mention about Cedric Neal's three million views on YouTube of his voice performance. Yeah. How? I mean, that? I just love that more people in the world know about him now, which is, is a good thing. Yeah, and he's also another one where, again, I know his him his voice and all the shows that he's been doing in lockdown have tended to be quite serious 
Um, and even before then, it's like all the shows I've seen him in have been sort of like cabarets where he could actually be really intense. Yeah. And this is a really nice sort of like change of personality. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Amazing. Right. Let's quickly wrap it up with one word each that describes a killer party. Fiona. Silly. Ridiculous. Fun. Amazing. But thank you again so much. It's been really fun. Okay. Good. Thank you. And uh, uh, hey. see you soon. soon probably. Yeah. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank you for watching. These videos are made completely free, so if you have enjoyed it, please do share it and subscribe to my channel if you would like to. I'm also setting up a charity called That Fest to raise money and awareness for HIV charities. If you'd like to donate, please do find out all the information on my website. Hi, I'm Philip Dehaney. And I'm Rob Isles. And we've set up That Fest to produce events and raise money and awareness for HIV charities. We will be producing events to celebrate and amplify the voices of artists living with HIV. After realizing that so many friends close to me are living with HIV, I felt that I needed to be doing more to raise awareness, not only to the LGBTQ plus community, but to everyone. We are committed to establishing That Fest as a platform to reduce stigma and to help to celebrate the artists living with HIV and tell their stories. We plan to curate and produce events, festivals and concerts showcasing new work alongside discussions, talks and music. We're looking to connect with artists living with HIV. Singers, dancers, actors, choreographers, directors. If you do it, let us know about it and email us at thatfest at thatstagyblog.com. We're really excited for our first project, which will be to release a new cover of A Little Respect by Erasure. We're looking for anybody with some singing ability to appear on the record. So get in touch with us. To help us produce these events, if you would like to make a donation, you can. Just head over to justgiving.com forward slash crowdfunding forward slash that fest. And don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook at that. Fest UK.